Well, good afternoon. I want to begin by thanking all of you for being here and for supporting our democracy in this important conversation about getting involved. I'm more convinced than I've ever been, and I have been the state superintendent of public instruction, but I also served at the local level, first as a planning commissioner and then as a member of the city council in the city of Union City. And that was 1980, and Union City had over 50 gangs. And we had a very serious gang problem. Many of you may not realize, but in fact, the chief of police of Union City, California, was assassinated in the Catholic Church, and so indeed by a gang member. And so indeed, there was a serious problem. And I'm interested, I came to talk about early childhood education, but I, I want to say to you from the bottom of my heart that, in fact, what we need right now are not people looking to the state or looking to Washington, D.C. for solutions. We need committed community members to join together, whether they are schools or cities or nonprofits or religious organizations. We need everybody to get together around and behind our children. The truth is that the last panel was especially inspirational to me, and I, I loved the definition of empathy that Kevin gave us, your pain in my heart, your feet in my shoes. The reality is that many of our students who today, and I, I do believe education is the solution, but I believe many of our students today do not really know and understand why education is so meaningful, so important, and so profoundly vital to their future. And I will just say to you, you know, some years ago, and by the way, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about research because we have some of the finest research institutions in the world here in California and America. But at the end of the day, if you have great research and you lack the vision and the courage and the heart to stand up for the children, the research isn't going to do you a lot of good. <clears throat> And we've had a lot of this vision and courage and heart in previous generations that didn't have vision. You know, you've, we forget that it was, it was Abraham Lincoln in the darkest days of the Civil War that decided to sign a bill called the Morrill Act. The Morrill Act that created a system of land-grant colleges. See, Lincoln dreamed that every working class kid, every agricultural laborer, would have a, would, children would have a chance to go to college. His predecessor, James Buchanan, who didn't have a civil war to fight, had vetoed the bill. But Lincoln dreamed that every college would have at least one, every state would have at least one college that would help kids like me to go to college. And so, in fact, when you say Cornell or Duke, you say Texas A&M or Florida A&M or Iowa State or a little place called UC Berkeley where uh, some of the students here are thinking about going, or UC Davis where I had a chance to go, UC Riverside, all land-grant colleges, all because Lincoln, who had no research, had the courage and the vision and the heart to dream big dreams for future generations. The reality is that when John Kennedy proposed that we send a man to the moon by the end of the 60s, by the end of the decade, everybody today says, oh, what a great idea. But at the time, some of us are old enough, I know some of you weren't born, but some of us are old enough to remember that he got made fun of. Mr. President, that's too expensive. Mr. President, that schedule is too ambitious. Mr. President, that's just too hard. And Lincoln said we go to the moon, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. So I want to talk to you about something that's hard, but it's something that, in fact, is essential for the success of this community, this county, of our state, and of our nation. The truth is, I have lived long enough to make this observation. There is nothing wrong with our children. There is, however, some concern about the adults. And I just have to say that what I want to talk today has been touched on by many of these fine panelists that we've had. But I want to talk to you about values. Because at the end of the day, budgets are statements of values. Now let me just tell you that the state of constitution, and I'm sorry to tell you that too few members of the California legislature know this is in the state constitution, but the state constitution says the number one priority of California, even before the payment of debt, shall be the education of children through the university. That's what the state constitution says. 
If that were true, would we be 49th in per pupil spending and number one in per prisoner expenditures? I don't think so. And yet we're 49th if you adjust for the cost of living, 37th if you don't adjust for the cost of living. But believe me, it does cost more to educate a kid in California than it does in Mississippi or Kentucky. And so in fact, I'm here to tell you that just as the global economy increased the importance of education, California and America seem to have lost their way. And so I want to talk, I want to start talking about preschool because that's really what we originally talked about. But then I'm going to move on to some other issues that have been raised here today. First, if I tell you, when I went to the French, I had a preschool task force. And they called for us to have universal preschool in California within a decade. The year was 1998. So we were trying to do it by 2008. By the way, some other states are doing it. Georgia, Oklahoma, and Florida, all because the citizens rose up and told the legislature with a referendum to do an initiative. The people get it. They know that preschool is important. They know the steepest curve of learning is zero to five. That there are certain things that if you don't teach a child by the time that child is five, you can't come back and reconnect those dots, re recreate those opportunities to learn. What I say is that every cent we invest in preschool and early childhood education is money that we save later on and the research tells us the kids who have preschool are more likely to finish high school. You say over 60% of our prisoners have not finished high school. Well, kids that go to preschool are more likely to finish high school. They're less likely to be unemployed for long periods of time. They are less likely to be in the criminal justice system. They are less likely to be on welfare. And, and they are much more likely to attend college and to succeed in life. The reality is we talk a lot about STEM in education. That's the new catchphrase, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. But the reality is we would do more to advance STEM education if we did more for universal preschool than any other single thing we could do. The, the authors of a wonderful book called The Scientists in the Crib wrote this. We're, we've argued that our otherwise mysterious adult ability to do science may be a kind of holdover from our infant learning abilities. Adult scientists take advantage of the natural human capacities that let children learn so much so quickly. It's not that children are little scientists, but that scientists are big children. <laughs> the University of North Carolina, not exactly a liberal place necessarily. They did a study called the Abbasidarian study. They found that the, the average IQ increase for a child that went to preschool in this country was 13 points. That's huge. But it's de minimis, almost nothing for a child whose mother is a college graduate. That means, what is it for a child whose mother has an IQ of 70 or less? Oh, it's only 33 points. 33 IQ points is the difference between being the janitor in this building and being the manager of this building. It's the difference between owning the hotel and managing it and being the person who changes the sheets. 33 points is huge, but 13 points is also very, very large. And for us to fail when every nation with which we are competing in the first world and most of the second world is invested in preschool and more states in our union, including New Jersey and New York and not just the Floridas and the jo Georgias have figured it out, the truth is we really should be investing in early childhood education. But what do the community colleges report to us? That their ECE departments have been cut dramatically and they've cut offerings by 30 to 35 percent and more and now with sequestration we're going to see bigger cuts in Head Start. Yet what do we know about preschool and this is my favorite line from the scientist in the crib. The authors put it this way, the human baby's computational system is really a network held together by language and love instead of by optic fiber. You see, there are little neural connections that are being made in the brain from zero to five. And some of them you can't come back later and reconnect. So the first thing this state and our nation should be investing in is universal preschool. And by the way, when Governor Schwarzenegger tried to take the money from First Five, which does do some health care and some of the advancement of preschool, he tried to take that money away and he, he asked you, the voters, what you thought of it. And by a two to one margin, you said nuts. 
No, absolutely not. You also denied him the chance to take money out of mental health. But the preschool thing really upset me because 20 times the legislature's been asked to raise tobacco taxes and 20 times they've been unable to do it. And every time the voters have gone and done it, somebody tries to steal the money. And I'm just here to tell you, it's really time for us to have a conversation about, about really and truly why budgets are statements of values. So I'm telling you again that there are connections that can only be made when a child is in preschool. I went and visited after our opportunity to have the task force. I went to France to visit a guest of the French American Foundation, not your tax dollars at work. I went to France with some other people from around the United States to look at the French preschools, and they were amazing. They're eight hours from eight to four, 8.30 to 4.30. You can buy wraparound services if you need to start earlier or have your child stay later. The lunch is an affair which has tablecloths and real plates and silverware and glassware. It's France, after all. The average subsidy for a lunch is $8 a child from preschool all the way through what we consider high school. And the children have this amazing opportunity to do music and art and lots and lots of play and small motor skill development stuff. So I asked the woman who was our escort, and she was, her English was fantastic. Her son is a doctor in Menlo Park, California. I, and she chewed me out a little bit about why we didn't have preschool here. And, but then I asked her, you know, what does your research tell you? What does your research, now that you've been at this for 50 years, what does it tell you? And she looks at me and she goes, <laughs> well, our research is not quite so good as your American research. Our universities are not so good. We use your research. And it tells us that it's the best. <laughs> so I want to say, first and foremost, if we really wanted to help the poorest children, the children on the margins, the children at the greatest risk, one of the first things we do is invest in universal preschool. California is one of those states that doesn't make kindergarten mandatory. Shame on us. All children should go to kindergarten, and kindergarten should be a full day affair. We have a lot to do here. But beyond that, and I want to say, my, I really can't say enough about the panels that we saw today, but I want to just say that more than that, we have to empower our students. We, we have to remember that great civilizations inspire great personal responsibility and great social responsibility. Great civilizations arise from the imagination and hard work of people who are nurtured by their societies to develop their gifts. In a word, education. Education, the place where personal and social responsibility come together for personal and social greatness, both together. That's where you and I come in. In a great civilization, cities and counties and nonprofits and schools are incubators of are institutional incubators of human potential. In every sense of the word, our job is to create institutional incubators of human potential in this democracy. We must ensure that every place that we go and every place that we live, that we understand our schools, our cities, our counties, are repositories of past respect, res success, and laboratories for the future adventures of our time. For the future greatness, not only of our country, we must make democracy a living, breathing place for, for the engagement of all of our students and our local citizenry, yes, young and old, and everybody in between. We must say to every child in this society, we need you. There are talents in you that you may not know about. <clears throat> maybe you know what they are, maybe you don't yet. That's okay, we need to help you identify them. We will help you to develop them, to put them to use. We, the society that loves you, and wants to work for you. And you must work with us, you must participate. But that means we all have to participate. The journalist Richard Cohen once observed, those with nothing to gain have nothing to lose. If you want to understand why our children join gangs and gave, engage in self-destructive behaviors, drop out, get pregnant in their early teen years, vandalize or self-destruct, remember how very costly it is for us to generation to have nothing to lose. The poet Nietzsche said it very eloquently. 
He was quoted by Viktor Frankl in a book about how he survived the Holocaust. Nietzsche wrote this, he who has a why to live can bear with almost any how. Our job is to give our students a why. We can talk all we want about test scores, and I'm for assessing achievement, but I also know you don't fatten a hog by weighing it more often. <laughs> and so we've got to be clear that we are about real education, not just finding the answer from a series of multiple choice questions, but about really being able to solve problems, about really being able to communicate, about really learning compassion and support for other people. You know, we, we frankly, right now, need you to get together as a community more than we ever have. Look, despite the blather you hear from a bunch of nut jobs, the reality is schools are really, really, really short on adults. We have the fewest number of adults per child. Largest class size in America, fewest number of administrators per child. We're dead last in the number of counselors, dead last in the number of psychologists, dead last in the number of nurses, librarians. We need people in the community to join together with our schools to help our kids to know that they, in fact, have someone who will work with them and to help them develop what <clears throat> an understanding of what's needed in this society. And let's just say, I want to stipulate to all of you, some of you are thinking, well, you know, but some of these kids are from dysfunctional families. I've now lived long enough to know that if you were not from a dysfunctional family, <laughs> you married someone from a dysfunctional family. <clears throat> or your best friend was from a dysfunctional family. I am a triple dipper. <clears throat> and so, recently, a report by James Heckman, an economist at the University of Chicago, a school not typically very influenced by class differences, offered this substantiation, quote, inequality in performance at school is strongly linked to inequality in family environments. Schools do little to reduce or enlarge the gaps in skills that are present when children enter schools. What we now know, though, is of, of the kids that have been raised in dysfunctional families, over 70% became functional adults. Some of you are in this room. And you know the thing I'm about to say is true. Number one, those who, over 70% who become functional adults had a mentor other than a parent, most commonly a teacher. But it could have been a police officer or a parole officer or a probation officer or a counselor. It could have been somebody from one of your programs that reached out and went that extra mile teaching soccer or doing something else. The truth is, the other thing that the kids who make it have in common is they got more education than their parents got. Those are the two big successful things. I grew up in a loving household, but there was real dysfunction. And my brother did die young of alcoholism. And so, in fact, it does have consequences. Some of us make it, some of us don't. But I will just tell you what happened in Union City, California, when the school district and the city decided to work together. Prop 13 had just recently passed. We were in trouble. And so I had just gotten elected council. I was a puppy, 1980. And we decided, I proposed that we put together a couple of members of the school board with a couple of members of the city council, the city uh, superintendent and the city school district superintendent, New Haven, and the city manager and we sat together and we talked about how we could work together. We decided to build the schools on city parks because then we could jointly maintain them and at least in Union City the schools were busy during the school year and the parks were empty and then summer would come the parks would be full and the schools would be empty. So we co-maintained them and then we made a decision to put a police officer on campus. Our chief of police was one of the guiding forces in this. His name was Mike Manick, a wonderful man for whom I have great respect. He'd studied to be a priest and was an exceptional human being. And he proposed that we pay half the cost of putting a sitting Union City police officer on the campus. And I know I'm disagreeing a little with Frankie on this, but because we put a young officer on campus and we, he, we told him not to focus on you know, misbehavior or searching lockers, we told him to focus on attendance. And you know what? The vote was three to two. 
And at the end of the first year, New Haven Unified had gotten hundreds of thousands more dollars. Because kids that aren't in school don't get paid for by the state. Did you know that? They got to be in the seats. They can't just have an excused absence. They got to be in the seat to get paid by the state of California. So the district picked up hundreds of thousands of dollars and, oh, by the way, the teen pregnancy rate went down. Graduation rate went up. Oh, and in Union City, the daytime crime rate dropped by 33%. Because kids that are in school are not breaking into your car at the BART station. They're not breaking into your house. The truth is they're not getting pregnant and they're not hanging out and getting in trouble. At the end of the day, within five years, New Haven's James Logan High School became a number one, top 10 in the state of California feeder for affirmative action to the University of California. And what's happened there is the schools have gotten better and the property values have gotten better and the city has gotten healthier. And in fact, some things have changed. We no longer do, the city no longer supports the cost of an officer. But when Kamala Harris became the district attorney of San Francisco, we had a conversation about this. And she figured out, just as a wonderful woman in LA, Brenda English, who was an assistant DA down there, that if the police officer calls and asks why Little Michael isn't in school today, it has a much more great, greater effect than if the attendance clerk, Mrs. McGillicuddy, called. <laughs> the truth is, we have got to treat truancy as if it is one of our number one problems in the state of California, because it's hurting us in terms of our educational failures, because the kids that stay home are the ones that are most likely to be behind and get further behind. But it also is hurting us in terms of bad behaviors that are happening by kids who really ought to be in school learning. I will just tell you that I, I also am very fond of a wonderful woman named Bonnie Bernard, who was, has been at West Edge. She's had, a, I think, recently retired. But she wrote a brilliant book on resiliency. And she points out that, in fact, we do need three things if we're really going to create resilient kids who are in tough circumstances. One, we need the protective factors of caring relationships high expectations and opportunities to participate and contribute. Isn't that what we heard up here today? We really need to give kids a chance to participate. And it could be in soccer, but it also could be in drama. It could be in music or it could be in science. It could be in a whole host of programs. But we've got to be able to figure out how to engage these kids. Second, Bonnie points out that no program design can compensate for a mentor who is not caring, respectful and reciprocal. Yes, we need mentors, but not ones who's going to put them down. We need mentors that are going to lift these kids up, make them responsible, and treat them with great respect. And third, and most importantly, Bonnie Bernard writes, quote, resilience research confirms unequivocally the power of one person to make a difference. I don't care if it's your niece or nephew or the kid next door. I don't care if it's somebody that you actually mentor or somebody that you just take under your wing. Remember, all of our kids are looking for the why. And if, we, if they don't have some of the teachers that I had, like Mrs. McClaws or Mr. Deck, if they don't have Mr. McFarlane or Ms. Holt, they may not make it. I had those teachers, or I might well be singing the song that Joan Baez wrote for Phil Oaks, There But For Fortune. Many of our panelists have been There But For Fortune members, but they're sitting in this room and you know them, they're in this community and they're everywhere. So I will just tell you that Archimedes the, in the ancient Greek democracy was once asked to explain his new innovation, his new innovation called the lever. He was asked just how powerful is this tool, this tool called the lever. And he thought for a moment and he said, let me tell you how powerful it is. Give me a place to stand and a fulcrum and a lever and I will move the world. I believe education is our lever in this time and that if we can make sure that our children have a connection to education, whether they get it through soccer or whether they get it through counseling or whether they get it through a community organization, that if we give them that lever that they will move our world that they will be more like the panelists that we saw today than the kids that I saw at the Youth Authority. 
By the way, most of them, I thought their parents should have been there instead of them. But the truth is that many of these kids go home and they don't have a parent or an adult that nurtures them and counsels them and supports them. They may be loving, but they may not be able to support them. We need then active citizens in this community, in this county, across this region. And we do need to make sure that we have our lever with us. Our young people need to know how to read and write and how to do math and science and how to do art and music and how to play sports. But they also need to know how is what I am doing today preparing me for tomorrow. I happen to think that our hope for competence and for economic success is in education, but it's also in this notion of democratic values where we say to all children, you have an opportunity to succeed in this world. So while I consider research to be of extreme importance, I consider the willingness of the people in this room today to take a risk, to take a chance, yes, to risk their budgets and to risk their time and to risk maybe the different cultures and different organizations trying to work together. But the truth is we have work to do and we better get on it. I mean, heck, almost said a bad word. America has the shortest school year in the world, practically. Most of the kids in the Europe are going 200 days a year. In, in Asia, they go 220 to 260. Our kids have three months off to bring in the crops. I don't think they're bringing in the crops. And so we need to engage. Yes, I believe in preschool. Yes, I believe in after school. But I actually believe in a longer school year because we got a lot of work to do. And. And I worked to add five days the school year, and Arnold Schwarzenegger took it away, and I think we ought to demand that it be given back, and then we have a program to add a day a year for the next 20 years until we're at 200 days. We got a lot to learn in this state, and it helps us get teacher salaries where they need to be, but it also helps to make sure that the kids aren't losing so much. Ask any teacher, the calendar's all screwy. The teachers will tell you they spend the first month refreshing the stuff the kids lost over the summer. Let's change the calendar. Give them three weeks at, in the winter. Give them two or three weeks in the spring instead of one. And make the summer that much shorter. The reality, I will just say to you in, in closing, is that we're really at a crossroads in America. We're at a crossroads in California. It's not OK to me to be number one in per-prisoner expenditure and number 49 in per-pupil expenditure. I really don't like having three strikes when the kid's third strike was stealing a bicycle. I met him at San Quentin. It's just wrong. We've got to, yes, have strong, good criminal justice laws. I'm for that. But we've also got to have some common sense here. Mark Twain said the problem with common sense, it's not very common. But <laughs> we need to be thinking about who we're, where we're spending our money. 59% of the federal budget goes to defense. For heaven's sakes, defense and veterans affairs, and I'm all for the veterans affairs, they're not doing a very good job in that part, but we can't afford to defend the whole world and we shouldn't be involved in wars that we don't pay for. The first war since 1848 that we didn't pay for was Afghanistan and the second was Iraq. We should have raised taxes, not cut them, and then you'd be yelling, get these guys home. You'd be really mad if we were actually paying up front instead of sending the bill to our children and grandchildren. America didn't used to do this. This is not the country I grew up in. And while I'm so proud of the Panama Canal and the Bay Bridge and the Golden Gate Bridge, I'm so proud of the Marshall Plan and the Manhattan Project, I will tell you more important than any of those things is the education of our children. It should be number one in this country. It should be number one in all of our minds. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. <clears throat> I'll tell you somebody who, who agreed with me, who said this in 1953. He said, every gun that is made, every rocket fired, every warship launched, signifies in a final sense a theft from those who are hungry and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of, his labor, of the laborers, the genius of its scientists, and the hopes of our children. His name was Dwight David Eisenhower, hardly soft on defense, but a man who believed very strongly that we had to fight 
for the future by standing up for our children. California is in jeopardy, and yet today I feel hope, because here's a very important, beautiful part of the state where people have come together because they know that, in fact, we can make a difference. And I'll just tell you, there's nothing more important than getting our young people educated and in this game of democracy where they can use, and we can use their wonderful optimism. I said at our table earlier, I used to, I used to think that what we needed was hope. But in fact, I think it's more than hope. I think what we need is optimism. And ladies and gentlemen, you get it from children. Remember, children can leap great barriers in a single bound. They have imagination. Children can see through anything. They see with their hearts. Children move mountains the old fashioned way. Remember, they have faith. Over the years of visiting schools, I've had an awakening. At first, it may seem to you like a trivial semantic distinction, but it is much more to me. It explains the power of a child's dream. When we look into the eyes of a child, we often think we see the face of hope, but I realize now what we really see is the face of optimism. There's a difference. We hope with our fingers crossed. Optimism is a hand waving in the back of the classroom. Optimism is running to the library. Optimism is trying again and again at the language lab or the computer lab or the basketball hoop or the soccer field. Optimism is a homeless girl wading in tide pools, dreaming of being a marine biologist. I met her in a school for homeless children in San Diego. I know her counterpart is here in Santa Cruz. America is not in need of hope. The beautiful possibility is obvious. America is in need of a good case of optimism, and you catch it from children and young people. Ladies and gentlemen, I am a carrier. So let us continue this important work on this wonderful afternoon in the city of Santa Cruz, the county of Santa Cruz, in California, and America, and let us do it with optimism. Thank you. <laughs>